Uh, good evening. So we are back again, and today the theme is uh, the greatest losses. So okay, I can also call it like the most painful losses. Well, this one which I'm going to tell you, it happened like uh, relatively a long time ago, but it was quite an interesting one. I haven't got back to to take a look at this game for quite a, a few years, and there are a lot of extra story connected with uh, with this game. First of all, it was my last Olympiad. It was in Istanbul in year 2000. It was the fourth Olympiad I've played for the Bulgarian team. And I have to be honest with you, this was the only Olympiad in which I especially prepared for this Olympiad. I mean, all the other three Olympiads, I had to play other tournaments all the time, so I didn't have like a special preparation for this event. And the Olympiads, in my opinion, are the toughest events. Because they are team events, you have to play quite responsibly, but also <coughs> You never know, I mean, which round you're going to play. It's a very <coughs> tough schedule. <coughs> and also you look at your colleagues. And our team was almost always playing with most of the, of the best teams. <coughs> but particularly this Olympiad in the in year 2000, there were a lot of, a lot of things connected with this <coughs> Olympiad and especially with our, with our Bulgarian team. So the coach of our team, the notorious uh, Silvio Danilov, the manager of uh, our best chess player, the ex-world champion Deslin Topalov, he made, even before the, the beginning of the Olympiad, some, okay, let's call them interesting uh, decisions. I will, we were living in Spain, I was living in Spain, he was living in Spain also with uh, Topalov. So he contacted me, we agreed that I'm going to play at least uh, 10 games, which I did in the first 11 rounds. So, okay, we had like a contract, everything was <coughs> clear. But then in our <coughs> team, and the selection of our team was quite curious because for the first time, Antoneta Stefanova played for our team. This is the ex uh, <coughs> women world champion. And she is incredibly talented and very good. But okay, maybe this was not the moment because she could have played for the women's team and they had a, you know, a very good team. <coughs> but he somehow uh, chose to, to take Antoneta to play in the men's team, not too many games. Okay, there were very special <coughs> circumstances. And when, I when I'm talking with you about uh, preparing for this uh, Olympiad, yes, for this Olympiad I had some time to prepare. Even I prepared a new opening. And this new opening was the French defense, which I always consider, and I still consider it a, a difficult opening. I mean, you have to know it very, very well to feel comfortable in many of these uh, positions with less space, uh, with a lot of suffering, so I never was fond of the French defense and I know it quite well because there is a fellow grandmaster from my hometown in Bulgaria, Vladimir Dimitrov, who played all his life French. So I was able to look at his analysis and his experiences, but I always felt very comfortable with the white side of the French. But just to have like a new opening, because although this was year 2000, the computers were starting to influence the game, not like today, but still you have to <coughs> prepare well, and it, it's like a good idea for a, such a responsible uh, tournament to play like a new opening, although my choice of French probably was a wrong one. It did fairly well at this uh, Olympiad. This was the only uh, loss against uh, one of the most talented players in the world scene. Still today, Gushchuk, I consider him an incredible player, very talented. Gushchuk in this time was a, a great specialist of the English attack against Nidorf, and Nidorf was my main weapon, and it maybe throughout the whole of my career it served me quite well. So I knew that if I play Nidorf against Gushchuk, he's going to play the English attack. And with a little bit of heavy heart, I started this game, playing the, the French. And it was no surprise that he played against me the advanced variation, because if you just check his results, uh, many, many pluses against the, the, the French in, in this advanced variation. Of course, he plays other lines too. Okay, we started with uh, e4, e6, d4, d5, e5, c5, the, the normal moves, bishop d7, 
bishop e2. This was expected, and now I just had one idea which I which I played in this game. This was probably prepared before that. Okay, it was like uh, almost 19 years ago, so I'm not very sure of all the details. But I remember that the idea with knight h6, knight f7, which I played in this game, was somewhat uh, analyzed, you know, in the months before the tournament. So okay, it was not like a big surprise to me, but I always felt not very sure in the advanced variation, and I have some uh, memory in when I was in the in the military, I played with a player which I was clearly much stronger, and I played with black. Uh, uh, this line I played with queen b6 instead of bishop d7, queen b6, a3, c4, just like Dimitrov, my uh, colleague from my hometown, Grandmaster Dimitrov, used to play. And we got absolutely close position and I couldn't win. I mean, it was completely uh, close position. And this, you know, bad experience from playing this variation, you know, always remained in my, in my head. So this time I wanted to play a little bit more in a more flexible way. So I didn't want to play like queen b6. And I played with bishop d7. I have prepared quite a, a risky line, this with f6. Well, it's also considered like a, one of the main lines. Although one of the greatest specialists of uh, French, Psakis, because here there are comments, his comments, okay, his comments in, in year 2000. So there, there are some mistakes, there are some evaluations which are not exactly true. But for me, it was quite interesting just to, to share with you uh, also a, a very good player, how he thought about this game and he played French all his life. So he is not very fond of the, of the move f6, but I, will, I want to play it like more dynamically. And I'm very far away from being a specialist on the black side of the French. No? So I played f6 here. He is more fond of playing knight g7, take knight f5, like playing with less space but more solidly. So maybe it's much more to, to Psaki's taste. But it was not my intention in this game. So castle, and okay, if you now take on e5, there was even a, a game played in, in this Olympiad. We're not going to ta take a look, but okay, it, it looks quite too risky because if you play it, let me just give you one example. Like take, 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 <coughs> bishop c6. Well, c4 like they played in this game just to, to play like a, an interesting uh, pawn structure. Is not the only the only way. I'm kind of a, don't like when I'm not developing my pieces. So this is the kind of position which I think that White has a lot of choices. Some of them dynamic. Some of the position like in this game they played like with with c4, trying you know to put knight on c3 maybe, and if to block the position with d4, then of course they have a, a position with more space in a in a clear square on e4 to, you know, transport their pieces, so I'm not very fond of this position. So it's no surprise that here I chose queen b6, a more dynamic, and now he surprised me. I was not, like I told you, very well prepared about this position, but he surprised me with knight a3. Nowadays I think that probably, you know, taking on c5, b4, like let me show you here on the board, like here, b4, and now playing even for some kind of a blockade, not wanting too much of an advantage, like bishop f4, or playing c4 very aggressively, you know, try to open the game before black has finished his development. And here you can see on the board some of its inconveniences. So the bishop on e7 takes like this square from the knight, and knight has to go to h6 and maybe to f7 and castle. So this is like black needs a little bit of time. They're not doing bad in the in the in the center, but they need some time. And if the position is open now, when white king is very safe, it can be dangerous for them. So here c4 is, is interesting. Well, bishop f4 is more, more positional. But okay, probably this would have been not very <coughs> comfortable for me. But we should choose knight a3. Probably he was <coughs> familiar with uh, this approach. But at least what I knew about this position is that I like this plan, just to take here and to play knight a6 and to put it on f7. Because the position of the knight on f7 gives me more flexibility. It controls the g5 uh, square, the bishop can go to e7, and then, okay, depending on the <coughs> circumstances, you can castle short, or, like in this game, you can castle long. Well, in this game I had to castle long, because immediately he follows with c4. Here, if you look at this position with the computer, of course, he'll recommend here to, to push b4. 
But on B4, it was not my intention to open the game because, okay, when I still have not finished my <coughs> development, I'm not keen to open the game. So I would have played Knight F7. How good is this position? I have my doubts, but I remember that I would have played here Knight F7. He has <coughs> like a more sharp approach, C4. Now D4, Bishop D3, Knight F7, Rook E1. Well, <coughs> now he has like a <coughs> good control of the center the knight is going to c2 and in order you know not to, to get in a position with less space and not much counterplay i think that i'm obliged here to castle castle long because then the position of my knight on f7 and the possibility to, to, to push some pawns on the king side gives me counterplay if not i'm going to be stuck with a similar position like one game which is given earlier here you can see even played at the same olympiad with a clear positional advantage because okay then when the knight is on f7 and i have castle short i can start pushing pawns in front of my king no and i'll be just clearly worse so this is the idea of the knight on f7 that if we can make it like a sharper sharper position so bishop e7 h4 this is purely a prophylactic move no and of course it's no problem if, if you castle if you castle short because if you castle short okay he plays knight c2 this pawn on h4 restricts the uh, black pieces and also sometimes it can be used just for uh, going into attack on the on the king side if the the black king hides on the king side but the black king does not have an intention to hide on the on the king side and here sakis has one suggestion which i really do not understand it very well so he says knight before bishop e4 and now to castle short well to castle short it's possible but he plays knight c2 and everything which i said before stands i mean in my opinion white has a clear positional advantage he has more space basically it's very difficult to understand where it's uh, black's counterplay and this especially for us humans we need to have you know some clear <coughs> play we need to know what we are doing we just can't stand without space and you know suffering and this is not the the idea okay maybe some experts a french they can suffer for a longer time but as i've been almost all my life like a Sicilian player and also a spanish player i don't like this kind of a you know suffering for a long time i i gotta have like a, it's a phrase i like like three results on the board so i don't like to have like this passive position with two possible results either you make a draw or you lose so this is not like my kind of thing so i make here a long castle knight c2 and here is very interesting to see what psakis says about the position not to uh, to put some critic on, on psakis because okay psakis he like look at the game he was not familiar with circumstances and he thought if you look at this game without knowing anything you see just you know just Khrushchev just crushed you know the black's position he made like a very good attack and everything is is clear well Sakis caught some of the of the moments quite quite right of the game some of them he missed them but okay he didn't have much time and this was probably not the only game he looked but I can give you some some interesting perspectives so now he says unfortunately for black the residence of the his king is much more insecure and black's counterplay probably will be late well this it may seem si uh, so if you look at the game but it's quite far away from the from the truth so here i felt that my position was was very good and quite interesting i have seen that if he plays what what followed in the game it was you know no no problem for me but there were some special circumstances and i repeat it's not an excuse it's just giving you <coughs> the facts which because we are humans can affect you during, <coughs> during a game and maybe okay like i told you probably this was like the ninth game i played i don't remember what was my off day but it is possible so you got tired at the olympiad <coughs> and you may not feel you know like uh, uh, physically tired but when you start making some inexplicable things some mistakes maybe your nervous system is starting to get a little bit tired in this very <coughs> strong and very uh, responsible events like the chess olympiad so here i played <coughs> rook d8 and quite unexpectedly even for me 
but because okay i was very mm, not uh, not happy that i i couldn't play you know the night of i couldn't get access to some <coughs> some of these analysis so i thought that my position is is very good and here a very bad psychological move and very untypical for me i very rarely have offered draws i'm not <coughs> very fond of offering draws but here because i thought that my position is <coughs> is good i'm threatening you know just to, to play g5 his attack on the on the queen side i have seen that it's not really going to happen i couldn't see how it's going to make it and that's why i offered a draw and i thought it okay here at least i'm going to get to have some rest and you should probably also think that his position is is nothing special and this is to put it mildly i thought that black has a, a good position well it was quite a surprise for me that he didn't answer anything which is quite all right but okay, this is also I, i'm not sure if it was like psychological move but sometimes you know chess players maybe in the past maybe nowadays too they pretend as if you if they don't hear you so you know sometimes I, there was some case i've read in the book that you know I, I didn't do that of course but sometimes they have to repeat their offer and they say oh yeah, i didn't hear you some now and oh he plays the move so this is like can put you in a, some kind of an awkward situation and here for me it was a surprise and i got you know this is like which this detail shows that you are tired if you became of this very small thing nervous and when he played his move a3 well i not only forgot what i what i wanted to play but i started you know to play very fast and this is like a, a position when not only you have like a easy move because okay you this is the the very um, uh, natural way to stop his play because he's threatening b4 so i have seen that that before and that on, on a3 you can play just queen b3 and it's not easy for him you know he, he needs a lot of time and this time will be used you know to get your counter play with g5 so still today i don't have an explanation why i didn't play it, uh, a queen b3 it's a very natural way it was why i offered him a draw because i thought that my position is is fine and just before showing you a3 just to show that it was not like uh, possible to transpose the move order just to play b4 and after you take to open the the queen side oh it will be like uh, great for white but okay i play a5 and still you, you need time because on a3 i'll have b3 you know b3 and if you go back i'll play a4 so it's not a clear way how you can open the the queen side so after a3 it was absolutely necessary to play queen b3 and that's why i put on g5 a question mark not because it's such a bad move because even if he takes on g5 you could have played queen b3 but okay if i just didn't play it here it means that i'm be, you know starting to lose control so you're becoming nervous and this happens and you're starting playing and i started to play very fast as if i was you know furious that he uh, didn't accept draw which was the most natural thing in the world because this was an important uh, match and okay he just he was absolutely right you know so this was a very interesting detail but it influenced the whole game because after that he continued to play normal moves the position was still a complex one by the way my play was like uh, somebody who was doomed so instead of playing queen b3 i played g5 which does not pay attention to his obvious play on the queen side and it's a receipt for disaster although the position or he takes on g5 still queen b3 is possible by the way i take on on g5 bishop takes on g5 he keeps his knight on f3 because his knight on f3 can be included even on the on the attack of the of the black king because when he plays b4 even the pawns on, on d4 becomes uh, a problem and okay it opens more fouls against the the black king well if you i repeat if you look at the whole game it seems like you know everything that white did is very easy and very natural but there were a couple of very <coughs> big mistakes so b4 like saki says and okay there is no dispute about that a very easy move which you made by the hands oh yes but it, it could have been prevented no so remember <coughs> these prophylactic measures when you sometimes you can take so here it was like a great uh, negligence not not to play like a perfect move like queen b3 
it's not like out of this world, you just prevent, you know, your opponent's play. So b4, bishop e7. Oh, bishop e7 is also like a, a bad move. It, it keeps uh, wasting time, and of course this is like a sharp position and you can afford this luxury. It is better really to play, and this was a suggestion by, by Tsakis, uh, rook g7 and then to double the rooks, and although it seems like he's having the initiative, <coughs> There were some mistakes which probably in the, in the uh, year 2000 when the computers were not so good, but I really think it's not about the strength of the computers. I think that here a position which he gave like this one, like he gave, it's, it's a clear advantage. In my opinion, you don't need a computer to see that if you take here and rook takes on g3, it doesn't matter what the computer gives. And I've checked it today and the computer says that black has a winning position. But okay, let's forget about that because the computers may say many things. But one thing is obvious, you have an attack. Or you can include the queen, you can include even the bishop from e8. So it's difficult here to play this with, with white. So I don't know why Psakis was so sure. But okay, this, of course, this is not a forced line. We can play differently with, uh, with white. But still, rook g7 and just, you know, trying to, to get your play going is the right way to go. But okay, here I have lost... Uh, control of the game, which you can see from the the moves to follow. And I play bishop e7, bishop e4, he just puts all his pieces on the right squares. And to play this game from the white side is much easier, because you play rook b1, bishop e4, and, you know, you try to open his king, which basically is not, not so difficult. Now, I gave here c takes on b4 a bad move. And yeah, it's a, it's a bad move, although it's not easy to suggest, you know, like a really good move here, because it's much easier to play with white. But still, opening the position, I, I don't like it. Maybe something else could have been tried, like rook g4. Only there is one detail that when the rook is on g4, sometimes it goes into the attack from the queen, no? If it takes on c5, rook b1, take on d4, so there is this detail. But still, there should be something better than c takes on b4. I mean, just, it seems like I'm... Uh, fighting with the uh, with the fire with with a gas, which basically everybody knows is not a very good idea. So I take on b4. He takes on b4, and knight takes on b4. Well, if I take with the with the bishop on b4, he takes takes on d4. Basically, okay, the attack is is going by itself. So here I play this move. Bishop takes on b4. <coughs> And now it's quite interesting that although the whole game looks like a, you know, very natural play, easy win, the next move is quite creative. It's not the best move, objectively, but it's interesting. And it has to do with, with a great talent each player. Although it's not so clear, he opens more lines, because he thinks that this is the right approach. <coughs> Technically, probably not the best move, because rook b1, here, the queen goes out of the pin, and knight takes on d4, probably is much more unpleasant, because the attack here is very, very strong. So if you look at this, the main detail is that he's attacking with almost all of his pieces, and you can't take the knight because the queen goes to a5, no? This is the very, the very important detail. But I was really surprised here by c5, although I thought that c5 was also good during the game, Really, I was not happy about seeing c5. Also, I thought that rook b1 is quite unpleasant. But c5, maybe objectively not good, but, you know, mm, you can imagine yourself in, in my shoes. I was very depressed by, you know, not playing the moves I wanted to play. And now he's opening all the lines against me and he's attacking me. And it's much more difficult to defend than to attack. No, sometimes in this position, and especially with so many open lines, to attack is more natural. You can easier find resources, and especially such talented player like Grishchuk. And defending here, and it's one detail I have to mention to you. So, very few players, and I can name you one legendary player, Anatoly Karpov, they had this special talent. So Karpov had two very special features. Not only he's a legendary player, but one of his features was that when he was at his best, and he was at his best for many, many years, at the end of the game, he started to play like nowadays Carlsen, he started to play even, even better. So, 
Four hours of the game has passed. Many of the players get a little bit tired, no? They started to make mistakes. And they start as if they are putting another gear. And they're starting to play even, even with a better quality. And this is, this is bringing a lot of points. So Karpov has <coughs> this habit. And another one, which has to do with, <coughs> with this game, and with my command, <coughs> Karpov, <coughs> and this is like a, <coughs> uh, a little bit like the superheroes, th this feature. So <coughs> imagine that Karpov is playing a game and you are pressing him. You have an advantage against him like <coughs> for four hours. <coughs> He's worse, you keep pressuring, he keeps defending, and he defended very well because he calculated these short lines with incredible precision. He calculated with incredible precision so he could defend very stubbornly. So after four hours, you're still a little bit better, but he has defended, and okay. In one moment, you say, okay, I can't do anything more, okay, it will be like a, a draw. So the position is equal, and you think that, like many, many players after such a tough defense, are going to be happy, and many players are happy. No, Karpu has, the, and not only Karpu, but very few players have this quality. He has just to forget what was in the past. And he's just started to play the position as an equal position, like nothing happened before. Like he never defended, and he's fresh as a cucumber, and he started playing. And, <laughs> and this special quality also brought him a lot of a lot of points. And this is just, you know, just this is exactly what the engines do. They don't have memory of what has been before. But we humans, most of us, like the humans, we have, you know, <coughs> this memory of what was before. So here, probably, also I was influenced by, oh, okay, I could have played earlier, better move, now I'm uh, under attack, I've played really bad. And this had to do it with the play after that. So c5, bishop take on c5, <coughs> well, this is absolutely the only move. I mean, no doubt about that. I was quite surprised to see that <coughs> here, uh, uh, Sakis thought that maybe black can play <coughs> queen at c7 but after taking here i mean you don't need to calculate much here no i mean <coughs> the black king is completely uh, alone and you don't need neither computers not anything i mean this is just just bad i didn't even consider that i mean it looked very very bad so bishop take on c5 only move rook b1 and now really uh, uh he calls Psakis this a serious mistake, but in my opinion, it's just an incredible blunder. I mean, you have to play your only move here, without any doubt. But I, I don't have a recollection if I had considered the only move Bishop I probably yes. But for some reasons, I was already in some kind of a mood that probably the position is bad. So you have to play here Bishop B5, the only move, and after Bishop D3, because, okay, if he, if he tries something more complex, like, say, knight d2, you can even have time to play d3, and the bishop on c5 can start, you know, influencing the game. So, bishop here, a6, and although, okay, he has the a line, he looks to have some uh, play. Well, this position after queen d3, b4, is not clear at all. The computers even hold, hold this position. Well, for, for a human player, it's still kind of a not so easy to play, but, okay, you have a two extra pawns, well, the bishop is not <coughs> probably great, but okay, the, the king will not get checkmated only on one line, because okay, if you double on the a line, then after check on e8, the king will go to c7, so not, not so clear, no? Not so clear at all. Now, this is just one, one line, but I didn't want to, <coughs> to give you lines, I just want you to have like the, the picture when you're playing the game, so you have to play this, because there is nothing else, so no doubt about that. And bishop b4, practically, is the end of the game. In my opinion, although it was a long time ago, it has to do with some big uh, calculation mistake. I think that after, like, queen c2, I probably miscalculated on, on bishop c6 this very simple rook takes on b4. Because even after queen c2, although this is probably better, but this position, in my opinion, should be lost. I mean, this one, I also don't have any any doubt about it it looks very bad i mean i don't have doubt i mean have to to run here with the king but in my opinion it was the the bad the really terrible lemon was was bishop b4 no? <coughs> after that in my opinion it has to do with a mistake on the on the uh bishop c6 so this is where something went uh, completely wrong 
And of course, okay, I never considered rook d8, rook d1, and okay, he's the one giving you checkmate, and you're walking, you know, through the the chessboard in a, some kind of a trance, no? So bishop c6. Yeah, he says here. <coughs> I don't remember what Taki says, but my comment is this: this is a simple oversight, but it has to do with some simple mistake. Probably in some of the lines of Kitako Cizek, I miss like a simple move, maybe rook d1. Okay, that, so take take rook takes from b4, and maybe I miss just simple after king b8. If you play king b8, that uh, he'll play just you know queen e4. Although here it's not about misses. I mean you you are really feeling bad in this moment of the game because okay it, you don't need to calculate here just to feel that you know your king is going to get checkmated. So this is like you know. Already the, the position is, is beyond uh, any salvation. So I played here, rook d1, and okay, here I got uh, checkmated. And this was my only loss in this Olympiad, but it was a good one. I mean, it was like a completely <coughs> devastating. Well, for our uh, good luck, we were able, we are able to, to win the match because Topov won, I think, against <coughs> Halifman. And who else won? We won. Two and a half, one and a half against uh, Russia for the last time I've met <coughs> because I've played uh, the first time in 94 uh, it was uh, Topalov you can see this game, it's quite uh, impressive Topalov gave checkmate to Kasparov with two rooks on the on the seventh rank in 20-something moves uh, Georgiev lost against Kramnik in some very long <coughs> slav uh, Spasov won an incredible game in French in French, yeah, against Dref so French is not is not easy but you have to know it very well and I was better with Black against Fiddler and he offered a join and we were winning the uh, the match Who and was the third player the, that you just mentioned before your match that won the French, you were playing the French? Yeah, Dref was, uh, lost against uh, Spasov and uh, the third board and uh, I made a draw with uh, Swidler. And the second time in 98, I think I played with White. Well, this was the only time I played with White against Vigintsev. And this was like a, a much easier uh, game. We won, I think, 3-1. And okay, the instruction of the coach, which was against the new force, you play against Vigintsev solid. And it, this was not difficult because Vigintsev plays the, the slab, so we, well, we played some kind of a slightly better position for White. But okay, if this kind of an instruction on a on a team match, when you're with white against solid players as Vaginsev, are not, not too, too difficult. Of course, okay, you can always have problems, but okay, I was quite happy to, to hear such an instruction. This was in, in 98. So th this game and this uh, checkmate I, I received was really something to, to remember. And it was a painful loss. But the next one, which I'm going to show you, was I still, even today, when I mm, had a recollection of this game, I still can't believe that, that this happened. And there were some circumstances which made this loss against a colleague of mine, a Bulgarian grandmaster who is a very original player, very talented. The circumstances of the next game are quite interesting and it makes the, the loss painful, not only because the position was completely, completely winning. And there are very interesting uh, things to take from this game was just not to not to repeat this kind of a many many mistake but also it was a very important game it was a qualification match in the greek team championship and if i have won uh, this game we would have our team would have classified in the premier league which we did in the, in the in the next in the next year which i won a very good game I also against the bulgarian grandmaster in the last in the in the decisive round yeah against nikov grandmaster nikov so yeah, I, but th this game, okay, I had everything, you know, everything in my in my hands, and okay, if you <coughs> fail in in such moment, it, it's really difficult. Okay, I'm going to show you the game because the game speaks <coughs> for itself. Even today, when I had <coughs> memories of this game, it's very it's very painful because <coughs> every one of us has lost like a <coughs> position with big advantage. But there were so many circumstances which I had to, to go and I have to be one thing which I want you to, to take from this game not to be practical, not to be like, like I did in, in, the, in the last phases of, of the game. So when you have many many choices just try to be 
to be practical. You'll see at the end of the game that when you have, you can choose between giving checkmate or having a completely one end game, going to the end game. Because something may happen. It may not be a checkmate. You can have a mirage. In the completely one end game, nothing is going to happen. But okay, when there are more pieces on the board, even, you know, even it looks improbable, but you see that it happened. So I was with, <coughs> with black, and after c4, the first move, <coughs> well, I'll give you some explanation, because after c4, <coughs> I didn't play it immediately e5, I like to play the position with a, <coughs> like the reversed uh, dragon, I like to play a position with, with black against c4, <coughs> which uh, black fights for space. So I like to play the reverse dragon, well, like c4, e5, they are like the reverse Sicilians, no? <coughs> with the tempo down, but at least you are always playing for space. So it's the kind of opening taste you have. But here I didn't play e5 because I didn't want in some of the lines of the reverse dragon to give him an option to put this knight not on c3 but on d2. So okay, I just, you know, if I played knight f6 and he plays knight c3, I would have played e5. So I was not avoiding the English, which I usually play, but I'm trying a little bit, you know, to, to give him less choice, just not to be very flexible. Well, of course, it didn't uh, make any difference because he has prepared another scheme. I couldn't uh, have an idea what he has prepared, but after a few moves, I already have an idea probably what was uh, waiting for me. So knight f6, because okay, we have played quite a few games in, in Bulgaria, in individual championship, and I repeat, this is a, a rather talented grandmaster with a very original style. So it's always a, a pleasure to play with him. Knight f6, knight f3. Well, now we, I already knew that it's going to be some kind of a Vienna game because in the Queen's Gambit I played the, the Vienna variation and when I see knight f3, obviously he has prepared some line. What line? Well, during the, the first move you're starting to get like a, a somewhat an idea about, but okay, you don't have, you don't know for sure. Well, Chateaubashev was no, never a great theoretician or he was not <coughs> preparing like deeply, but uh, for this game probably he had like a, a week or a little bit more of time, so even after the game I didn't ask him, but I think I, I had an idea what was prepared. So e6, <coughs> d4, d5, <coughs> and after bishop g5, already this fourth move I knew that <coughs> he didn't want just to play the, the normal Vienna lines, which starts with knight c3, d takes on c4, the Vienna variation of the Queen's, <coughs> Queen's Gambit accepted, which I played for a long, long time. So obviously he, he wants a not so popular line, a Gambit line, but, but quite interesting one, with a knight on d2. Because okay, there is no need to play <coughs> bishop g5, bishop b4, and knight c3, if you can play knight c3, you're not avoiding anything. So when you see bishop g5, I was already <coughs> had an idea that maybe around <coughs> a few moves after that, a new idea is, is waiting for me. And yes, he had a, an idea, although probably this time I was a little bit uh, able to, to surprise him a little bit earlier. But not with something prepared, simply I was quite, uh, uh, quite uh, familiar with this type of position. So this, this is what helped me in this game, in, in the opening phase. So bishop b, uh, g5, bishop b4, knight e2. This was his idea. D takes here, queen c2, b5. <coughs> now, the inclusion of these moves a4 and c6, now you see, the whole idea to include a4 and c6 <coughs> is when he takes from f6, not to be able to take with the queen. Because after the exchange from b5, he'll have queen e4. <coughs> queen e4 and, and the rook on e8 has problems. Well, and okay, I was aware about that. So that's why he includes here a a4. This I wanted to explain to you. So a4, c6, and now he takes on f6. At least, you know, this prevents queen takes on f6. By the way, it has also some obvious handicaps, because when you exchange a dark squared bishop, you take a lot of fringe possibility. You make the black uh, pawn structure worse. But okay, the bishop, the dark squared bishop and the control of all these complex of squares of dark is very, very important. And you have already sacrificed a pawn. So you have to be sure, you know, to get like a, a real compensation. Something which didn't happen in this game. So take g3, bishop b7, bishop g2, 
97 castle and here is what I thought that he has prepared before the game because here it was played before a6 and okay a game which I slightly remembered I had some doubt that white has a kind of a interesting position of compensation but during the game I thought here for 20 minutes and I couldn't see why I should play a6 when I can make the bishop on b4 even stronger with a natural move like a5 and this was over the board because I like I told you I was familiar with this type of position so I made this on novelty and after some years after that it was even played by the the seconds of, uh, of Anand now the very well famous uh, grandmaster Wojtacek a5 and okay after that black had very good results in this position so probably disappeared the whole position so this was a novelty over the board well nothing extraordinary simply I think that the whole white's idea is nothing special so a5 over the board which gives you more space and especially the bishop from b7 cannot not only be you know closed behind the, his pawns but he has chance you know to get into play how he can get into play well he has to to push here b3 and after the exchange you have more dynamic options so you can take on a4 and play bishop e6 bishop b5 you can play knight b6 or you can play like in the game one idea which has to do with the catalan ideas which you've seen in the in the catalan opening which here is no no surprise at all so i played uh, he played b3 take take castle well later i think here they even played immediately b takes on a4 and bishop a6 immediately activating you know uh, the bishop well it may be strong but i think that my move for the first try is quite all right so castle and okay now of course because you have uh, not only more space for your pieces but the pawn on a5 is well protected so he doesn't have any kind of this uh, Bogu Indian ideas just to take on b5 knight g5 and to take your bishop because okay there is nobody here no you play rook a7 there is no pawns on a6 which are hanging so the the black pawns are not under attack and the pawn on a5 clearly gives you more space so no motives like a takes from b5 knight g5 because you just keep you know taking the knight and you play rook a7 and okay everything is is good because on the dark squares you are the master on the light squares basically there is nobody to attack so rook fc1 looking for some positional compensation and now this is a, a well-known uh, catalan idea and it has to do of course with the having more space with the right idea a5 because if the pawn is on a6 and you play the following move rook a7 well it will be a little bit ridiculous but now it makes sense no because i'll play queen e8 and then now i'm ready to play okay just to to open the game and i'm playing here where he has sacrificed the pawn but basically on the queen side i'm having you know probably pass pawns and it it even you know with the course of the game it even overpassed all of my hopes but here i thought that after the opening i have a clear advantage so no doubt about that and his next move i'm not going to go into detail he could have played something else but i still think that this position is is clearly much easier to play with with black and his compensation is is very very symbolic but his next move just proved that you know he has mm, real doubts about his play and he just plays a move just to, to try to show that maybe he has some compensation but okay here nobody after the next move mm, can can try to to give me a feeling that after move like h4 you have a compensation so this is just a move which clearly shows that okay something is wrong with white position so they are trying somehow you know not to do more uh, damage to his position and waiting for you to make mistakes which here for a long time didn't happen so i kept playing some quite uh, logical moves let me show you i played here queen e7 knight e1 well trying at least you know to put the knight on d3 to get some positional compensation knight b6 <coughs> so you're pressing on a4 and now he has to open the position but when he opens the position then your extra pawn and the pass pawns on the queen side are basically are going to decide the game and still you have the question where is exactly white's compensation for anything so knight b6 now if he takes on c6 let me show you just 
not many lines in this in this game. The the most important lines are when the, the tragedy happened at the end. So if he takes here, you take, and okay, you have a pair a pair of bishops, no, and probably giving, you know, a, a lot of damage to the, the black bishop. This is probably you know as good as resignable, no. So. If he plays like knight c5, you can just take it, <coughs> knight e4, rook d8, and okay, I mean, here, I don't see, he, he doesn't have any squares where to put his pieces, so you have two pawns which any endgame is decided immediately, and even you can have <coughs> this kind of a, that's why I show this kind of a <coughs> typical, typical uh, <coughs> tactics, no? If it takes on, on c5, you play rook d1. This is like the weak back rank, no? Rook d1, and after he goes away, you take, and this, this rook here is hanging. Yeah, not... But okay, the position is, is very good for, for black. So he takes, and th this should be like a technical position, no? I mean, and that's why I think that I've played it quite, quite well. Let us follow knight d3, rook c8 with a tempo. And the more moves you can make in a good position with a tempo, well, everything is going very good. So, um, knight c5. <coughs> well, I put here like a, like a dubious mark, but okay, everything was not was not good here. In a bad position, it's much easier to give advice that you should have played another move. <coughs> but in this kind of position, in, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. You have like extra pawn and two pass pawn on the queen side, so everything should be quite easy. Take on c5, if he takes with a pawn, you put knight on c4, and here, of course, it makes it much easier, the fact that you have the same piece on the ball. If it's like different minor pieces, you may have some kind of a chance, but if, if it's the same minor pieces, it makes the position even easier. That's why they say that the, the knight endings are like pawn endings. Why they say that? Because, okay, the knights have a special feature, they can win a tempo, no? So that's why, you know, it, it has like this kind of a character like, like the, the pawn ending. So, take here, knight takes from c5, queen d5, queen d3, knight c4. Well, here if he pushes e4, it even includes, you know, the motive that the queen may not be de defended, no, on d3. For example, if you play here, you have to be careful of the rook takes from c5. So it's not making your position stronger, it makes it even more vulnerable. Although it's not, it's not need like great efforts anymore. Well, I thought that, but maybe that's why it ended very badly. So knight d6, a good move. Like I said here in my comments, I have a two pass pawn, an extra, an extra pawn in total, and no threats at all. So everything is going fine, and of course we are on the on the twenty third move. So no kind of a time travel, no, and okay. Even at the end, he had less time than me when bad things started to happen. So e4, queen h5, good, rook c7. Now even the pin is a problem for him, no? So not, not only all these factors which, which we have mentioned, but even he has a pin on the c line, no? As if it, it needed like another problem, no? Now, king g2, because okay, he has to, to consider some time, you know, e5, like if he plays queen f4, I can push e5, no, not very pleasant, uh, e5, d5, and now the most easiest move, oh, not, not the only one, but here, okay, <coughs> during the game, I didn't even consider, maybe for seconds, why to give him in you know, such, a, such a bad position, why to give him such a chance, so, so be aware, in a, such a favorable position, not to give him this kind of a, a lucky chances, like knight c4, and to give him like this, d6, no? Now if he takes on c5, you know, he can take on c5, d7, and another queen appears. Of course, it's not, it's not needed for you to do that, but still, you know, you have everything under control, and suddenly, because, you know, you're playing one careless move, and okay, this kind of a mistakes, when you have time, is not, you know, and there is no need to move the knight on d6, no, the blocked piece, usually has a, a very good effect now. Why to, to move it and to create some kind of dynamics in the position? So no need at all. So I play f5, 
even my queen now becomes more active, so everything seems that the game is over. If he takes queen takes from a5, no play at all. Now, even today looking at the at this game, it it gives me very very bad <coughs> sensation. So, f3, queen g6. Well, now I thought, although we are at the 28th move, and I repeat, this is a, a team <coughs> competition and a, a very <coughs> important match, the most important match and a, in the decisive round. But I, I really, during the end, I thought, oh, maybe he'll resign. I didn't see a move. I really couldn't see a move here. I mean, you're threatening everything. You're threatening <coughs> f4, you're threatening even queen takes on g3. So I thought, okay, I mean, okay, so probably he'll congratulate me. And and I had like, after a few moves, you say I have tw 12 minutes, he had two minutes. So here probably I had like 20 minutes or something. So okay, I, I really didn't see what white will play. But you don't have to, to get into this kind of a uh, situation when you start, you know, enjoying so much your position, then you, you're not uh, um, concentrated. Although here I has not lost my concentration, the next, the next move is really a big lemon, although this is objectively the best move in the position, and I thought that this is the best move, but still it's a very impractical decision. So in this moment when I couldn't see a single move, no, you can't, he can't take on f5, no, because uh, knight takes on f5, no? Everything is hanging here, basically, no move. So he plays knight d3, and here I start thinking, and I still nowadays I don't have explanation why I didn't play it a very very <coughs> simple move because I saw here that okay there is this very simple end game I mean simple is even stretching it no you can play f4 no it doesn't matter if you play queen e1 queen f2 you just take take no uh, just one detail and, and this I saw during the game okay this probably everyone will see because it's there is no lines no if he takes with the with a knight the rook on b1 is hanging you can take even knight takes on e4. Not that you needed it, but okay, it's it's helping, no? So it, because all of your pieces are better, no? Just to to show it on the board. Knight c1, you can even take here, although you don't even need that. But okay, why not to take everything, no? So he takes here, you exchange, <coughs> and the game is over. You have two pass pawns, and okay, here I gave lines, but okay, you don't need lines. You know that this end game is if you are playing a a pawn ending and you have two connected pass pawns. So hey, this is the game is over, <coughs> your team <laughs> qualifies. And anyway, so to, to lose such a game, even now as you can imagine what kind of a feeling is after the game. If after so many years, like how much it's now now 12 years, I still have mm, very bad memories about <coughs> this game. So instead of that. I decided, no, no, I'm going to play like the move which I think is giving checkmate, no? And it's really winning immediately, but still it's an impractical decision. So I gave him check, rook c2, and this is the best move, but a very bad move. So, okay, this also happens in chess, no? Not the only move, also taking here was okay, but okay, no need to, to calculate like many lines. If you see one line which clearly wins, go through this line. And if it's an end game like this one, go for this one. No need to give him checkmate, because not only they don't give you more than one point for a victory, but you are putting, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter. It's a team competition or maybe individual. You're putting yourself at a minimum risk. Well, something which I forgot here, so I tried, you know, to play for a <laughs> for an attack. And okay, let's see how it finished. Check, check, king h3. So here. <coughs> I had, here I, I see in my notes, I have 12 minutes against two of my opponent. And suddenly, because it needs a little bit of calculation, although a very easy one, I started making incredible mistakes and I started having some kind of a mirages. So first of all, I don't play the simplest take on e4. So after knight takes on e5, you just give check, you know, on f5 and the game is over. So he has to take here. Let's go back a little bit. Uh, he has to go. He has to take with a pawn on e4. You take knight takes on e4, and basically there is nothing to, to calculate here. Here and the knight. If the knight goes, queen g4 is a checkmate. By the way, maybe in in my state this was a little bit too complex for me. So I thought that okay, there is like a, a easier move. Knight takes on e4, 
And I saw exactly what happened in the game. So I told it after knight e4, he has to play rook g1. This is what was my, my way of thinking, rook g1. And I thought that here he doesn't have any kind of threat. Because in my way of thinking, I said, okay, is he threatening something? No, I can even defend my pawn on e5. Because he can't take my knight, because queen g4 <coughs> is checkmate. If he plays g4 and he takes even on a5, well, I'll play knight f2. And I'm still winning. And this was like a complete, complete mirage. And because of that, you see in the end. Well, here, of course, there was like h5 quite strong with the same motive because it's very difficult to defend to defend your knight, no? Because if you go back, queen g4 is some kind of a smoother checkmate. But maybe it was too complex for me in my state of mind. This is also quite easily winning. But neglecting that he, he can have any kind of uh, threat because probably, okay, the, the course of the game makes you feel that way. You're not only ma making complete blunders, but you start feeling that, okay, you are playing only, only by yourself. There is no opponent. Huh? So he doesn't have any, any kind of threats. So that's why I play f6, which is like a big mistake. And after f6, he plays g4. And here starts the panic because suddenly I see that if I play like h5, which I plan to say, let me show you. He takes here and on knight here, he just takes it. And I can resign. So, okay. Now, of course, I start having less time and I'm starting, you know, missing almost everything. And I could have played here move, like different moves. But okay, f6 was a, a very bad move. And it has to do with the previous calculation. Just let me show you. Here I considered such a move. This is the, the so-called remaining image. I considered rook c3. And I thought that it's quite good. I thought it's winning. Because on knight takes on e5, you have queen f5 check, no? This intermediate check. And I considered some lines and I thought, okay, maybe I have something even easier because, like I told you earlier, I was not uh, aware that he, after g4, you know, he's threatening take on f5 and I don't have knight f2. So I even considered that, which should be like a uh, not too difficult win, a too complex. And I thought, okay, I can permit myself the luxury to play f6. After I played f6 and I saw that I have missed a very, very simple thing, I still had the rook on c3, like in the previous line, after playing rook c3. So this explains like the next move, which is like the end of this very, very tragic game. But oh, it has to do, you know, with a sort of a panic, with a sort of a complete uh, disbelief that how this can happen to me, how such an incredible position can turn out. So in my mind, my rook was on c3. So that's why I play here already in time chopper. I probably I have seconds here. I play the end of, you know, this tragedy. f4, he just takes here. And now I saw that I can take the knight on d3 because the rook is not on c3, no? And okay, then of course what follows is a very <laughs> painful loss in a very important game. Anyway, he is, you know, just accepting the <laughs> accepting the <clears throat> the defeat. And yes, still nowadays, if I look at the end of this game, it's it's really giving me a lot of uh, bad memory. But it's like nowadays when I look at it, it's less like a a very <clears throat> Uh, deserved loss because hey, you, you don't have to be impractical during a, a chess game. You have to, you know, just to, to try to remember that, okay, the end of the game is very important for you and it's, it's not any different than if you give checkmate or you just win the game. It, it's always one point, so you have to be a little bit more practical and just not to, to complicate your life because then even, you know, incredible mistakes can be made. It's very painful, but okay. I had to, to live with it and I fight it on the next year just to be able to, to help the team. So thank you for uh, being here with me and to share with you this uh, memory of mine. And you'll see that, okay, when the, the years progressed and in the last year when I'm not active anymore, well, more painful losses followed because, okay, when you're not active, you start missing things, which is so just like every other game, it needs it needs uh, to play constantly because if not, you're starting losing the, the habits. Mm -hmm.